Hello, I'm Alec Avdokov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. I would like to start out the episode to catch an error that I made in the last episode. I said that the Dutch were Catholic, even though they were absolutely not. They were a Calvinist nation, meaning that they were fiercely Protestant and even anti-Catholic. This was a major error on my part. I would also like to take this opportunity to say that there will be a story involving the Dutch on my Patreon account that only patrons will be able to listen to. To give you a bit of heads up on what it's about, it involves the Dutch Prime Minister and cannibalism. This story is 100% true and 100% bonkers. Please go to my Patreon account. There, I will answer any questions you have, and you will get more interesting and wacky content from yours truly. Now, I will answer a question I have from my mom, who surprisingly has listened to every episode so far. She asked where Prussia is today. If you go to Google and look up a map of Prussia, you will see that East Prussia is now where Poland and the very small territory of Russia are at. The name Prussia is not just a combination of Poland and Russia. Instead, it is the English language being bad at other languages. Prussia in German is Preußen, and not many people in English-speaking countries speak German. They can't pronounce it, and so the word Preußen became corrupted into Prussia. I would seriously love to hear feedback from you all. Rate me on Apple Podcasts, comment if you listen from Podbean, and the best way to get answers from your questions is my email, which is in the episode description and is aavdikov one at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and now let's get on to the show. Last episode, we heard about the crazy long and important rain of Louis the Fourteenth. With this, we talked about the insane court, the conflicts between the king and nobles, and the wars, ending with the Nine Years' War. But now we travel back to Brandenburg in the swamp and sand of the old mark. There we see the great elector in his prime in the year 1657. His third son had just been born. And though we do not know this for certain, He was probably thinking that he wants to be a better father than his father was to him. See, if you remember the third episode, The Great Elector Part 1, you will know that the Great Elector had no experience in governmental affairs. This is because Georg Wilhelm had called Frederick Wilhelm back to East Prussia, and Frederick Wilhelm said no way, because he was afraid he was going to be married off to a Habsburg princess. He probably didn't say this to his dad, but it would have been very funny if he did. He said, I don't want to marry a Habsburg. They're all inbred, and have you seen the size of their chins? Just to clarify, he never said this, but I put it in there for comedic effect. Why not? Either way, Frederick Wilhelm would eventually go back to East Prussia, and Georg Wilhelm felt disrespected and stopped interacting with his son right as he was about to die. Therefore, Frederick Wilhelm wanted to make sure that he wasn't that bad because he inherited the worst situation that Brandenburg had ever been in with no experience. So, let's fast forward to 1674. The oldest living son of the great elector was a dashing young man who was just like his father. He was interested in military and politics, A perfect successor to the throne, Charles Emmanuel, the successor to the glorious elector of Brandenburg. Oh no, he died of dysentery! Now, the great elector had Frederick. A man who was, according to the book, The Iron Kingdom by Christopher Clark, Frederick was highly strung, sensitive, and partially disabled by a childhood injury. The great elector said about his son, My son is good for nothing. In 1681, about seven years before Frederick was going to inherit the throne, 
Thank you, Dad, for saying that I actually am good at something, because wow, that would suck. Their relationship took a nosedive in 1687, when Frederick's brother died unexpectedly, and Frederick thought that his brother had been poisoned, and he was next. Keep in mind that this is not Frederick the Great, but his grandfather. Anyway, he fled to Hanover, saying that Berlin was too dangerous to be in. The great elector took him out of succession, and it took the Holy Roman Emperor and the King of England to set up an intervention to put Frederick back into succession just months before the great elector died. And so, when the final breaths of the great elector were taken in April 1688, Frederick III became the elector of Brandenburg in a cool spring morning. Do you remember the quote from episode 4, The Great Elector Part 2, from the Great Elector's Political Testament? Well, here's what he said. Take good care that you do not keep a much too extensive court, but reduce it on occasion. Always regulate the expenditures according to the revenues, and have officials diligently render receipts every year. When the finances are in a good state again, then you will have enough means, and you will not have to request money from the estates or address them. So, when Frederick became the elector in 1688, did he follow his great father's prudent advice to keep a small court and a balanced budget? <laughs> oh, nope! He would embark upon the greatest spreading spree that any Hohenzollern had ever done and made a court that would even rival Louis XIV. He had a love for jewels, and mind you, this was before diamonds became common for people because Europe had hardly any diamonds. However, emulating the decadent court of Louis XIV was not the only thing that the elector Frederick did. Frederick encouraged the growth of the military to 40,000 men by 1713. He was a supportive of science in his court, and he, although is often not credited for doing so, helped the finances of Brandenburg. Frederick is often not remembered because the actions of his predecessor and successor are so vast compared to his own. He was also involved in two gigantic wars that will receive their own special episodes, the War of the Spanish Succession and the Great Northern War. However, there were bigger names that were involved in those wars. The big three that come to mind are obviously Louis XIV of France, Peter the Great of Russia, and Leopold I of the Holy Roman Empire. With these titans surrounding him, it is understandable that we do not remember Frederick III of Brandenburg. However, he created something that would define the trajectory of Central Europe for the next two centuries. He created the kingdom in Prussia. This was preceded by four years of intense negotiations that Frederick would eventually come out on top of. But why create a kingdom, and how could there be a king if there was already an emperor? See, back in those days, a prince in the Holy Roman Empire could be a king of a foreign territory outside the Holy Roman Empire. The Peace of Westphalia forbade any creation of new kingdoms within the Holy Roman Empire. However, there are already two titles of kings within the Holy Roman Empire, the King of the Romans and the King of Bohemia. It was like Edna Mode in The Incredibles, except for no capes, it was no kings. However, if you look at a map of Brandenburg in 1700, you will see that the Duchy of Prussia was outside the Holy Roman Empire. And, thanks to the efforts of the Great Elector in 1657 in the Treaty of Velau, Prussia was a sovereign territory of the Holy Roman em of the Hohenzollern family. Therefore, Frederick wanted to utilize this foreign territory to make him king. According to the Rise of Brandenburg Prussia by Margaret Shannon, by winning the title of king, Frederick raised his political reputation and the status of Brandenburg Prussia. He supported the conventional view that a lavish court 
was a symbol of prestige and power. I believe that Frederick thought by making himself the title of a king, he would make his domain more respected by other powers. According to his grandson, this is false. Frederick was great in small things and small in great things. However, my absolutely unqualified opinion is that without him becoming king, I do not think that Frederick the Great could have had what he had, a sense of outward respectability that comes with being king. The title the elector does not have the same oomph behind it as the word king does. Even in German, the word König sounds much more strong than the word Kirfest. To round out the podcast, I will give a rundown about why Frederick's title was the king in Prussia, the coronation of Frederick I of Prussia, and the domestic policies of Frederick I. If you Google a map of the kingdom in Prussia from 1701, when the kingdom was first established, you will see that the Hohenzollern family had lands that were disconnected from east to west. The farthest eastern territory is called East Prussia. This is where the title of Prussia gets its name from. Again, remember that Prussia is a German-speaking territory and not Russian. And this is a very common mistake, especially where I come from. Anyway, if you were to zoom in between the territories of Pomerania and East Prussia, you will see that there is a Polish territory that causes the disconnect between the two Hohenzollern lands. This land, the land in which Danzig is placed, is called West Prussia. West Prussia was a mix between a German-speaking and Polish-speaking territory. The German speakers tended to live more north along the Baltic coast whereas the Polish speakers lived in the south and inland areas. Everybody got that? Good. So, the reasons the negotiations were so intense is that both the Holy Roman Emperor and the King of Poland did not want Frederick to become king. The Emperor was a Habsburg and therefore felt that having another person within the empire with the title of king would be bad. He already held both royal titles of the King of the Romans and the King of Bohemia. The Emperor didn't want to have another king mucking things about. The King of Poland, on the other hand, wished that things were the way they were back in the old days, when Prussia was a vassal state of Poland instead of being an independent territory. He also wanted to be sure that Frederick would not be called the King of Prussia because he might want to claim West Prussia as well, a territory that was outside his realm. This was unacceptable to the King of Poland, who did not want to lose any more territory than Poland already had. However, it was international pressure that Prussia had no control over that worked in Prussia's favor. The War of the Spanish Succession had just started up, and the emperor allowed Frederick to become king only if he would side with him against the French in the war. Frederick obviously accepted. Snow was on the ground in the chilly, crisp air of Königsberg in East Prussia. It was January 18, 1701, as the procession of 30,000 horses made their way through the streets. This coronation was designed by Frederick himself and cost the Prussians an estimated 6 million thalers. This is double the yearly income of the entire state put together. This is how it happened according to Christopher Clark's book, The Iron Kingdom. The coronation itself began on the morning of 18th of January in the audience chamber of the elector, where a throne had been erected specially for the occasion. Dressed in a scarlet and gold coat glittering in diamond buttons and a crimson mantle with an ermine lining and attended by a small gathering of family members, courtiers, and senior local officials, the elector placed the crown on his own head, took his scepter in his hand, and received the homage of those present. January 18th. 
If you are keen on your Hohenzollern family, you will remember that January 18th was the same date that the German Empire was proclaimed in the Palace of Versailles in 1871. Side note about the coronation. Frederick I's wife was really bored during the whole coronation, and she was against it from the start, believing that it was against the interests of her homeland, Hanover. She was so bored that she even took snuffs of tobacco during the ceremony. What a bold lady that Frederick would miss. When Frederick's wife died in 1705, he put the whole court in a state of mourning. People were only allowed to wear black cloaks, and the whole atmosphere, which was previously one of frivolity, was now one of sorrow. Frederick got really pissed when Louis XIV, a man he personally adored, did not put his court into mourning when Frederick's wife died. This was mainly due to the fact that Prussia was on the opposite side of the War of the Spanish Succession. Sadly, I will not have time to talk about the wars that shaped Frederick's reign as king in Prussia. Instead, if you will indulge me, I will talk about the domestic policies of Frederick I's reign. Margaret Shannon's book, The Rise of Brandenburg, Prussia, perfectly sums it up in my view. In domestic matters, as well as foreign policy, historians have been unwilling to give much credit to the elector king, Frederick. His policies have been dismissed as wasteful or unproductive, in sharp contrast to those of his successor, King Frederick Wilhelm. The denigration of Frederick's reputation began with his grandson, Frederick the Great. Even one of his biographers admit, dwarfed by the achievements of the reputations of his father and of his son, Frederick has also been dwarfed in the historical memory. This was partly a matter of personality. Frederick lacked the Spartan toughness and resolve of the other two kings. He had certain tastes that were atypical of the Hohenzollerns, such as a love of precious jewels, as well as a well-meaning paternalist. He wanted to win his people's affection by lightening their burdens. However, he did continue the good policies of his father. Also, he did not have the same work ethic as his father did in the affairs of state, and let his privy council, or the council of the king's ministers, do most of the policy making in the land. Frederick was more concerned about copying Louis XIV's court, and he ordered an exact copy of Louis's wig, if that's not creepy enough for you. Nah. However, good economic steps were taken during his reign. He created the Central Accounting Bureau, or the Hofkammer, during the second year of his reign in 1689 that created a national budget. However, there was a major screw-up in 1709 through 1710, when in East Prussia there was an outbreak of plague. King Frederick allowed corruption to take place under his nose due to him not being the center of government, and the plague killed about 300,000 people in a population of one and a half million. All in all, I would sum up his reign in the same way that Frederick the Great did. He was great in small things and small in great things. It was thanks to the system of brilliant Prussian bureaucracy that was set up in his father's reign that allowed for prosperity in his reign. However, the plague would be a major black spot in his otherwise okay record. Now, on his deathbed in the winter of 1713, I shall have to leave you at. An eventful time for Prussia, a time of glory and science for the upper class, but misery and death for the lower classes. The wars that I glossed over will be the main feature of our next few episodes, and then we will move onwards to look at a violent, dyslexic, angry young man who will create the modern court of Prussia. He will be the second king of Prussia, and he is Frederick Wilhelm, the father of Frederick the Great. 
Thank you all for listening. If you made it this far, go to my Patreon account and donate as much or as little as you can. Thank you. I will now conclude by quoting the Song of Prussia, or Preussenlied. Ich bin ein Preisser, will ein Preisser sein. I am a Prussian and want nothing but to be a Prussian.